Hi guys and welcome back to our Adventure Experts series where we invite you to sit down with us as we discuss travel, adventure and alternative living with people who are actually living this lifestyle. Yeah, these videos are in a longer format and they're also available in podcasts and they're just designed for you to sit with us while we chat with Adventure Experts so you can learn um, from them. Yeah, and today our subject is the Pan American Highway. Now we're actually sitting down with Aaron from Hippie Van Man. Some of you may know him because he's also been documenting his travels across the Pan American Highway for the past couple of years. So this is going to be very interesting for anyone that's considering doing the Pan American Highway and possibly even some of you that have done it. Yes, if you have done it, please leave any suggestions and advice or stories down below so that all the community, all of us can learn from each other because that's what this Adventure Experts is all about. It certainly is. Let's take it away. Aaron, Ben, Leah. <laughs> I'd say welcome, but we're sat here in your van, which thank feels you. like welcome. If it, thank you, <laughs> it feels like quite a privilege having watched you on the internet um, and followed your amazing journey. And now we've managed to actually get together. So today we're going to be talking about that journey, about the infamous Pan American Highway, the longest road in the world. But um, before we dive into all of that and and you know like get some tips for people that are hoping to do this, yeah. Give us a bit of background about like your project and how you kind of started out. All right, so uh, I picked up this this '79 uh, back in 2011. It was a spur of the moment. Uh, I saw it on Craigslist and the price was right, and made a deal with the previous owner and picked it up. And then over the course of a few months, started working on it, converting it, and. Uh, Took it to Burning Man with four friends and back, and then I took off to Europe or to Asia for a few years. Uh, for or, a few years? <laughs> no, a year and a half. Sorry, it's still a long time. <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah, and, uh, and then towards the end of the trip, I was thinking, what's next? And I said, well, I have this awesome Volkswagen, and what's the biggest road trip I could do? Well, Pan America. So uh, yeah, with that, I, I came back from Asia and had about a six month. Uh, leeway to get prepared and then I just hit the road and, and started the hippie van man to kind of uh, follow the journey and, and share the journey with others and you know give other people the, the inspiration if maybe they'd want to start their own kind of mm -hmm. van life journey or you know whatever. So you started <laughs> roughly the same time as Ben, Ben started his journey, roughly. I think I was slightly ahead like just I was already on the road in South America, I think. Oh. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I started uh, August 2013 on... on uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I was probably Canada. broken down in some mechanic somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> crying was, at that point. Funny story was actually... I had started... When I started creating Hippie Van Man, I was looking for other people doing similar things, and I came across uh, Hasta Alaska. And, and that uh, didn't put you off? Well, <laughs> that was half of the motivation for doing my engine rebuild at the start of my trip uh, with someone much more experienced than myself because I was still relatively novice with, with uh, working with Volkswagens and cars in general. Um, so thankfully, because of watching Ben's uh, troubles, he saved me quite a few by just biting the bullet and, and doing the rebuild at the start. And That's probably great Smart advice way, straight, yeah. straight off the bat. I mean you can fix problems that you encounter anywhere in the world like you will be able to do it it's not impossible people do it that live there so you can fix problems but if you can eliminate some of those problems by starting out with a sound motor you'll probably enjoy your time a lot more yeah because it's a long yeah. journey so preparing the van as much as possible yeah for the journey and you know doing so from the comfort of of your mm -hmm. own home or, or like somewhere that you've planned to do it rather than where you're kind of forced to do it, I guess, is a little bit easier. You know, you have more access to tools and, yeah. and so on, right? Yeah. So before, when you started um, or thought about doing this journey, how long did you plan on taking or wanting to? Did you have a, um, a uh, date was, in mind or was, was just going and seeing how long it would take you? Yeah, it was pretty open-ended. Uh, luckily, because of my work, I can kind of work from the road, just need some Wi-Fi. It's kind of similar to, like, you guys but a little different niche uh, what, what we're doing but um 
so yeah, I was kind of just open, open ended, and was gonna see see how it went. And I kind of had in mind, like that was that was August two thousand thirteen. I left, and I kind of had in mind that maybe I would try to try to get to Brazil for the World Cup. But uh, I'm sure you guys know, you know, you you get down the road and you mm-hmm. find these places, and you end up staying longer, and, and you know. That's actually one of the questions I think um, I'd like to ask you is like, what do you think is um, the right amount of time to do this kind of trip or let me rephrase that the minimum and the maximum like how quickly do you think you could do the Pan American Highway um well, I'd say just generally the longer you have the the more you're going to enjoy I find like mm-hmm. you know staying longer time in, in certain places you you kind of get past just that initial seeing the place and actually kind of experiencing it more so it, I'd always recommend as as much time as you can possibly give to the the journey. Try to take it um, minimum. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I up until hard. even <laughs> into Mexico, I had people asking me at gas stations. So, how many days did it take yeah. to get here from Chile? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, days? Like this is year number three. Yeah. <laughs> they were really like, what? Yeah, I think I, I've met like a few people who've done it on motorcycle rather quickly, like. That tends Probably to be the couple, norm, actually. Yeah, a couple months or something, yeah. maybe. A like, couple months? You, well, that tends yeah. to be the thing, because motorcycle travel is more uncomfortable. You're exposed to the mm-hmm. elements. Like, you know, it's been raining all day. You pull over, you have to sleep in a tent, or your stuff's wet. Mm-hmm. It's kind of miserable. It's very exciting. It's very hardcore. And I definitely want to do it one day. But people that do it on bikes tend to do it quickly. Yeah. yeah. So I guess... As long as possible. Is. <laughs> you look pretty comfortable sat here in the hippie van yeah. right now. I mean, this is this is like a lounge, right? This yeah. is not something you'd have on a motorbike. So, no. you know, yeah. just for that reason alone, I think that's why yeah. motorcyclists do it quicker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So roughly people that want to do this trip or planning on doing it, um, really it's better to get as much time as you can to do it because yeah. there are going to be things like breakdowns and things that are going to stop like and you know run yeah. out of money that you want to be prepared for as well exactly yeah. or even places yeah. that you just fall in love with and yeah you, and you, want want to you don't want to be you know oh i, I have the schedule i gotta to stick to i only have this one you know yeah two more months or... you you hit onto a point just before you said that you were kind of planning this trip for like six months like doing mm. a bit of research and thinking about it a lot of people get stuck in the planning stage for years. Mm-hmm. Um, what advice do you have for people that are thinking about doing it? I would say, like, uh, as far as my planning, it was more so more so preparation of the van. Just uh, I redid kind of the interior configuration and uh, got it kind of more, you know, working on the mechanics of everything. Um, but as far as planning, you know, I did a little bit of research about the, the Darien Gap, which is obviously, like, a big concern everyone has. That yeah. Like, how am I going to ship it from Panama to Colombia? Mm. Like, and, uh, but, yeah, besides that, I mean, I just figured I'd just, you know, kind of go with the flow, follow the one, and wherever, you know, the offshoots take you. And, yeah. And, I didn't do a whole whole lot other than that. Mm-hmm. I don't think you really need to personally. I, I think that um, a lot of people are in the dreaming stage, and they some of them move on to the planning stage, and even fewer of those people move on to the actual doing the adventure. And the biggest obstacle people have is moving from planning to doing. Yeah. And so the quicker you can do that the better really mm-hmm. like because you can fix everything you can you'll know how you want to set up your van once you've been living in it a while you know you'll know what kind of travel you like doing once you've experienced all yeah. that different type of travel but some people only have a certain amount of time like they're only off work for a couple of months or six yeah. months at a time or whatever so they need to be they don't want to have to sit and you know yeah on the side that, of the road yeah. fixing stuff. i guess they that's be... that's a big consideration is if you have an open-ended schedule you don't really need to plan you, you know it's much easier to go with the flow but if mm-hmm. you do have a limited amount of time you want to use it you know mm-hmm. wisely and see stuff but uh but i find like so many you get to places and you find out about stuff that like you know you might not have encountered in a guidebook or whatever yeah. and like that's that's part of the joy of the adventure is yeah uh, and um, speaking of planning stage, did you learn Spanish beforehand or did you learn it on the road? Uh, I had backpacked once in South America for six months uh, and like picked up some basics, but not really, not even really at a conversational level, more like a, you know, necessity level. And so essentially it was all just picked up along the mm-hmm. way. Do you how think you need it? Yeah. How important do you think Spanish is? I don't, I don't think you need it at all. And I wouldn't like, I definitely wouldn't let that 
you know, stop, stop you. you or scare you away. Um, I think it's like it definitely adds to the value of the trip when you can mm -hmm. communicate with a, a larger, you know, pop portion of the population versus just yeah. the people who've, who've learned English. It changed my trip for me. Like I had more um, memorable uh, cultural experiences when, when I could speak the language, you know, just even the little conversations with people. And like I did, at the, the beginning, I spoke no Spanish. And after six months, I spoke enough to get by and converse with my, most people. But it was just so much more rewarding once I could. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a, a struggle to, to learn and it takes time and you're going to feel, you know, silly and stupid making mistakes. But like, uh, you know, people want to help you for the most part and, and it's it's worth the worth the struggle, I'd say. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I don't think it's necessary. If you, I yeah. don't think that should be a barrier for people that no. don't speak it. And you don't necessarily have to learn it, but mm. you probably would get more from your trip mm, yeah. if you did. Mm -hmm. Um, another question that people would want to know before they start out is where would you do you sleep on the road? Like obviously you have a camper yeah. and you can sleep in here, but do you usually just find a spot, a quiet spot to camp? Yes. Is it safe? And so yeah, I get this question a lot as well. Um, I I usually say it's about like a 30, 30, 30 split between like couch surfing. Uh, for those that don't know, check out couchsurfing.org. Um, and then sleeping in the van 30% of the time, and then uh, hostels or hotels and stuff. Um, Can you remember if there was like a typical price of a, a night's accommodation? Mm, a lot of the times, like having the the, the bus with me, uh, the van, a lot of the times if I was going to stay, like paid accommodation, such as a hostel or something, I'd try to negotiate it like... A deal like hey I'm gonna crash in my van I just really need to use you know mm. your your facilities and the Wi-Fi or whatever and uh, was that from a security point of view so that you could keep an eye on your van or just because you were trying to keep the cost um, down partly because the cost I mean it seems silly to pay for a bed when you have like a super comfortable bed with you mm -hmm. um, sometimes it f for security reasons um, but yeah I guess just most probably mostly cost and in, in comfort, convenience, you have everything here. You don't have to bring all your, you know, your bag inside and mm -hmm. deal with that, right? So, and I guess, like, finding a place to park. Uh, a lot of the time, like, in, in U.S., Canada, Walmart parking lots are great. Not to, you know, promo Walmart or anything, but they have an open policy to accept campers and RVs, and it's, like, safe. They have, you know, security cameras and Wi-Fi and washrooms open, so it's really convenient. And you're not going to get hassled by the police or anyone. Um, I guess like in Latin America, uh, if possible, and I'm by the ocean, like beach camping is ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to kind of go with your gut feeling. I, I always kind of stress that to people is like it's important to kind of feel it out. Like, is this a place where, where someone might see an opportunity to, you know, oh, there's this foreign vehicle here that, you know, might have goodies inside, like. You are a bit of a target when you're in the hippie van. I mean, yeah. you know, well, you see this thing a mile away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by the same by the same token, I feel like people see the license plates, Pazzy and more, peace and love in Spanish. And maybe that's like giving me some good karma or whatever. Yeah. I totally agree. With you. <laughs> yeah, I, to I, I totally agree. And, with you. Uh, and like having curtains, I mean, a lot of the time, I, I think that also helps if you just people don't know who, how many people are inside, who's inside and. If there's like those kind of uncertainties, I feel like that's probably another deterrent for keeping people from, you know, yeah. trying to tr get in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, go with your gut. Uh, I've also done urban camping. I think we were talking about that the mm -hmm. other day. I'm sure you guys have done it as well. Yeah. And like <laughs> that has a whole nother group of challenges and, and stuff. So, I mean, especially using the washroom. If you're camped at the beach or, you know, off in the woods or in the mountains, you can just hop out and, and uh, go. But if you're in nermid setting you know it's not not as easy to do so so you yeah. know you might want to have a, a wide necked uh, water bottle or some sort of yeah, bucket you, or you something you don't have a shower a, <laughs> no a i don't have a shower i was yeah i will usually if i if i can't find one i mean a lot of beaches you'll find you'll find beach showers mm -hmm. and stuff like that or you know you, again you can just pay a hostel a few bucks to use theirs um but otherwise i just use a use a like a you know couple gallon thing of water and pour it all over myself yeah good to go yeah. but i have noticed ben's uh sh 
road shower, which so is, is pretty cool. So yeah. I'm thinking I might either try a DIY project or maybe if road shower is listening <laughs> and you want to send a road shower to a, a it man might just be listening. <laughs> <laughs> just saying, just saying. <laughs> Yeah, right. No, it's pretty useful having a shower on your roof. You mm. know, yeah. that thing's getting hot right now, and by the time the sun goes down and I'm wanting to get cleaned up for the evening, I've got you know, warm, a warm water shower that can be pressurised too. So, yeah. yeah, we've enjoyed it. And some other things you'll come across in this journey is the um, prices of gas. Yeah. Like, is that a big, is that something that people need to kind of think about um, budget for? I mean, I've, I found for the most part, it all was like within 20 cents or so per like per liter, more or less the same up and down like Ecuador and uh, Venezuela, Venezuela. Had, I didn't go there, but Ecuador had super cheap gas. I think it's subsidized by the government. It's great, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I spent more time there just because of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did circles around the country literally yeah. because it was just so cheap and it's not a huge country either, but uh so it's yeah. roughly about a dollar a yeah. litre, which is well, for American people, three seventy-five a gallon, something yeah, like that, something roughly. Like that. So Do you know roughly how much you spent on gas in the whole trip? You didn't keep track. No, I didn't keep very good books. I'm like, you can't, you can't help it. You've got to get from A to B. Yeah. it's an, it's an expense that you need to, mm. you know, account well, we for. Get, so. we, asked, we get asked that a lot. Like people want to know exactly mm -hmm. how much it will cost to do this trip, roughly, or exactly how yeah. roughly yeah. how much it will cost. And it all depends on obviously. I mean, there's a lot of variables. What yeah. kind of car you're driving? How much weight you're hauling? Yeah. Sure. You know, are you going off-roading? Are you just sticking to the highway? Are you doing city driving? Mm. I mean, it, yeah. it does depend on what kind of trip you want because if you if you were to go to, like, um, you know, every national park that you had to pay for or, or get a guide in every for every trek you want to go on, mm -hmm. obviously your costs would be much higher, but you can do it really, really cheaply. Like, the we averaged at around 10 bucks a day by sharing the van with other people. So, mm -hmm. that like, if there was five of us, there'd be 50 bucks a day for the combi and all the food and the, and the gas. And we travelled really slowly, so it is possible to make it cheap. Um, but a lot of people are wondering how much it costs to, to do the Pan American Highway. Um, well, how much they should start out with. Do you, do you think that, like, gas would be the, your main expense? Yeah, I would say definitely uh, gas was the main expense. Um, food is, is relatively low cost in, in most of the countries so once you get south of the U.S. Um, yeah, I, I mean, accommodations, because a lot of, you know, more than 50% of the time I'm either in the, the bus or, or uh, couch surfing. I mean, even the times you do stay in hostels you're, or hotels or whatever, you're not going to be paying more than 10 or $15, I mean, for... Mm for a half decent place I mean again it comes down to what kind of comforts and luxuries you want or don't want uh, but yeah yeah and if you do run out of money like there are people that stop and start mm -hmm. again like they stop and they park up their van somewhere and they yeah. go home and work for a little bit or whatever to get some more money yeah. have you ever had to leave your bus somewhere yeah. uh so I have um I mean I'm working from the road so it wasn't really because I ran out of money per se but uh, you know, if you're on an extended two and a half, three year trip or something, you, you want to visit your family or, you know, if there's friends or something getting married or funeral or whatever, you know, there's reasons you might, you know, have to go home or want to go home. And, uh, so that's another like logistical challenge. Uh, I did it once from Columbia, which was really hassle free. It was only for like three weeks. So, uh, my temporary import permit, uh, was valid throughout the time and it didn't matter so I just left and came back and it was all good. Where did you store the, the van? Uh, like a paid parking lot I think I, for like three weeks paid I don't know 75 bucks or something it was like totally reasonable. And it was secure? Yeah no I didn't have any issues that was in Midian. Um, so that time was good. The second time I, I went back for it was like a few months and that was from Peru and that time was a lot more challenging because uh, the temporary import permit would have expired while I was out of the country so I had to go through this nightmare of a bureaucratic process kind of cancelling it and getting it verified that the car was stored at a certain location and getting that notarized and all yeah all this stuff yeah, um, yeah luckily I had the help of, of 
a local who I met through couch surfing, uh, which yeah, helped a good. lot. Yeah. Um, and then coming back and like reclaiming the vehicle, I'd say was even more difficult because it was just like any excuse to make make it more difficult. I felt like that's what the government was, the mm -hmm. government workers or whatever were trying to do. Like, I mean, being totally un unreasonable about something like the car being parked one block from, you know, 50 meters from uh, where the said address was, mm. like, they wouldn't accept that and, and had, had told me they'd have to come back another day when it was at the correct address. It was just crazy. and that, That's kind of typical, though, of the bureaucratic process of yeah. doing things like, you know, crossing the Darien Gap, which we'll get into onto in a minute. So, I mean, and border crossings too can be a bit of a pain, like doing jumping through all the hoops and mm -hmm. getting all the paperwork signed. It's just part of it, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I found the the border crossings like weren't weren't too terrible. Like I won't, definitely wouldn't let that be something to yeah. discourage you from going. I mean, you just have to. Typically, you need to cancel your temporary import permit from the country you're coming from, and then get a new one, and then when you're going to. Do your, your and all your all the facilities to do that are, are right there. It's kind of you, like you're yeah. guided through, like go to that yeah. office, go to here, and so I mean I found that typically I would expect to spend anywhere between an hour and two or three, depending on yeah. whether they were having lunch, you know, in the middle of that process. Yeah. So do, would you say that's the same for you? Yeah, pretty typical. Let's say two yeah. or three hours. Don't go or around nighttime. A lot of borders close. I think around uh, yeah. six or seven or whatever. So try to go early in the morning. Early in the morning's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about insurance? Insurance, a, a lot of, well, like, coming from Canada, my Canadian insurance was valid in the U.S. So then uh, going into Mexico, I had to purchase a new policy. And Mexico, as far as I could find, you can only buy six months is the minimum. So it was like 160 bucks for six months, which is cheaper than my North American, my Canadian mm -hmm. policy. But still quite expensive compared i felt like south of mexico you'd, you'd never pay more than like 15 dollars or whatever for a three month uh mm, thing, it's cheap. Right? you'd say like 15 probably on average yeah or? i think um for the most part we we personally didn't have insurance unless it was compulsory at the mm. border um, and in, if it was compulsory i think in every single situation we were able to get the insurance there then and there yeah. maybe there was like one situation where the insurance office had been closed early yeah. and the border was still open so we had to like sleep at the border and wait until the morning but i mean yeah that doesn't matter you've got your house there yeah i think uh for me it was only argentina was the only one i had trouble that they didn't have insurance at the border but everything else was yeah yeah pays to do a little bit of research because these kind of things change with time as well you mm -hmm. know th most of the advice that's in this um this podcast this video is our our experience um and it will be relevant to a lot of people that do it in two five five years yeah. time but some of it especially the borders and you know anything to do with visas yeah everybody should check for their there's, particular situation yeah. there's a, a site that i really uh, i use pretty much for every border crossing is uh, drive the americas and i checked it actually a, a week or two ago and it's been down for the i don't know what's going on with them but I found that like for every single border crossing, they have like uh, instructions and stuff, and then yeah. there's other people have like kind of updated and commented like a yeah. wiki, right? So that's real useful. Yeah, that's a good resource. I hope they bring it back. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it was just like an issue with their server, or, yeah. Yeah. Mm. or maybe there needs to be a Hasta Alaska <laughs> no <way>. resource. <laughs> See what <laughs> work. Yeah, you guys have your hands full. There are some the... people that do these journeys and they, they get all the details about how much it cost and, you know, how exactly they procedurally went through all of these tasks and they blog about it. And that's great for people like you mm -hmm. and I that are planning mm -hmm. and other people that are planning to do the stuff. And then there are other people that share pictures or videos and, you know, so other people can kind of virtually enjoy the journey from that perspective. You're that guy. I'm that guy. You yeah. can't do both. Yeah. Oh, you could if you were Superman. I'm not Superman. Yeah. I think I'm more in the creative side than the, the yeah. document documenting like uh, yeah. of but logistics. I'm still happy <laughs> those people exist. Yes, yeah. you know they make it easier for people like us. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And you, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Internet people. There's this um, road trip, this Pan American Highway trip. Um, 
everyone that we've spoken to that have done it have, have had some kind of trouble mechanically. So that's something that you need to be prepared for. Either have like um, some money saved aside just in case you need mm -hmm. to spend it on fixing your car or be mechanically um, knowledgeable a little yeah. bit. To, did yeah. you fix your car a lot along the way or did you um, come across many big disasters like Ben? Well, like coming back to <laughs> earlier on in, in the conversation, I did do quite a bit of prep work to, yeah. to try to avoid that. And it, for the most part, it was like smooth sailing all the way until Ecuador I had a uh, accelerator cable snap and like just luck of of the universe I don't know I pulled up right in front of a house that had a Volkswagen Beetle in front of it <laughs> and uh, this guy was sitting on the owner was sitting on the porch and he just kind of came out and said oh what's going on and within I don't know 20 30 minutes he had jerry-rigged my my uh, accelerator ca accelerator cable with uh, some bike leftover bike parts he had in his yard and I was back on the road and got to the next major town and, mm -hmm. and got the proper uh, cable swapped out and besides that um, did you yeah. make sure you, you just had a maintenance schedule made sure that you just did uh, everything you didn't even do that you, I mean, really you, do, your, you do your oil <laughs> changes every yeah, just, uh, every x kilometers yeah. and like because it's a long drive it's a long yeah. journey like, longest road in the world yeah. longest road in the world yeah it is, I, I don't know it was pure luck or just the preparation leading up to yeah, it maybe. or mix a mix of both or mm. You did have the advantage that um, you weren't carrying like 10 people in the back of your car, which... That probably helped. <laughs> yeah. If anyone was planning on doing this Pan American trip in a in a Volkswagen, yeah. don't take 10 people. <laughs> That's a bad idea. Yeah. And I don't know the validity of it, but uh, I've heard that the, the German-made VWs are, have a, a little bit better uh, quality than... Not, not to be no, what are you saying? <laughs> that, right? Hey, broke. How many times did you do an engine swap? <laughs> did you hear that, Capito? <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I don't know the validity, but within the Volkswagen I've community, too. I've heard it quite a bit, and it could just be like you know that superiority complex <laughs> of North American Volkswagen enthusiasts. But it seemed like driving through Latin America, that was like. A lot of people from Latin America were really, you know, after getting German-made Volkswagens yeah. as well. So as they should. Um, can we just take a quick break? I want to make sure all the cameras are still rolling yeah. and yeah. stuff. Cool. Well, guys, I hope you're enjoying the conversation. I hope you're not too overloaded. Yeah, I hope it's useful for you and that you're finding it interesting and informative. Um, if some of you are interested in hearing a little bit about our travels across the Pan American Highway, we have documented everything in video in our travel series, which is linked up there on the eye icon. And also we wrote a book about our undocumented um, adventures in South America. So if you want to hear the un untold story from our adventure on the Pan American Highway, that's a, a donation based book. So you can actually get it for free if you if you want or just ch chuck a couple of bucks down to help us continue to create free content like this. Coming up in the rest of the conversation is lots more awesome information. So uh, stay tuned for that. We're back. <laughs> yes. Back. All right, another so. question that people want to know when they um, speak to us is um, about the Darien Gap. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Do you think that puts anybody off? I think so. I, I felt quite anxious, like, reading other people's accounts. There's the so most many... dangerous jungle in the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not so much that, but just the <laughs> hassle of, like, having to ship your, your vehicle, right? And it is a pretty, like, substantial cost. I would yeah. almost say that was one of the, the largest costs of the sure. trip. How much was it, roughly? Uh, I think I paid fifteen fifteen hundred once all was all the taxes and everything on what did you get for that? How did you cross the gap? So that was uh through an agent in Panama. Um can't recall the, the agency, but it was like a hundred dollar fee to her, then there's like maybe two hundred import fees in then Panama and then there's like nine hundred for the container and then another three hundred in fees in, in Columbia. That's like roughly the breakdown as I recall it. You know, it was a few years ago now. But um, one thing I'll point out was like when I talked to the agent, she's like, oh yeah, you can load the, the, the your car right into the container and and you'll get to lock the lock the container up and it's completely safe and secure, which was like complete crap because mm -hmm. we showed up to the port and 
the port workers are like, no, you're not allowed into the port. You need to give us your keys. And like, yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, to hear that. because of the advice I had been given, like I totally didn't prepare anything and had a few like you know small insignificant things stolen. But it was just more of like a it was annoying that you know I could have easily prevented it if I had known. But yeah, that's I good. Think you had that yeah. problem too. So. Yeah, well, I, I went a different way. I went roll on, roll off, which is like the the scumbag mm -hmm. cheap option. Um, it cost me six hundred and sixty dollars at the time, which is pretty cheap. Um, but I had to hand over my keys to somebody going the opposite direction in Colombia and pick up my van in Panama like five days later. Um, and everything that wasn't tied down was stolen in between. So, yeah. but I, I had two huge boxes on the roof. Um, and I put anything valuable up there, so I, I didn't really miss anything. Yeah, mm. that's good. But I guess that's a good point. If they do have access to your vehicle, they will steal stuff. Yeah. Yeah, when I sh so that, once I made it down to Argentina, I actually shipped the, the van back up to Mexico, which was ironically cheaper than the, the you know, 400-kilometer Darien Gap versus the, what, 20, 30,000 kilometer uh, really? up to Mexico. It was only 900 with all the taxes and fees in. Um, cause yeah, that was another concern was like, I was going to drive this, you know, my, my home and my, you know, uh, down to Argentina and I was like, was I going to just have to bail and leave it there or, you know, sell it there? You know, it would have been kind of a drag. It would be nice to continue adventuring in it. So I wonder what percentage of people that, that cause I think mm -hmm. a lot of people drive north to south mm -hmm. rather than the other way around. I think, um, mainly, um, Argentinos um drive yeah. from the south to the north and me um so it's more typical to do it your way and i wonder what percentage of, the, of those people ship it back yeah. or if they drive it back because it's a long flipping way yeah it's, i mean i think w once is enough <laughs> it's a great trip and like maybe i'd re-explored in you know 10 20 years or something like that would be cool but i think like just after you finish this massive journey like down or massive journey up like you're not you know you've seen seen a lot and you're maybe not so keen on doing doing the whole thing over again in reverse so yeah no yeah i think so um so let's keep talking about the darien because i know that's darien, yeah. um, something that people were quite concerned about um how did you once you did all of this paperwork and you'd yeah. signed it up signed uh, put your vehicle yeah. um in the container how long did they tell you before you had to be in Colombia? I think it was a week. They gave me a week, right. and uh, and you and have to pay storage fees, right? If you're if you yeah, take longer. Yeah. So then, so that was kind of influenced my choice of like how, because you're not allowed to go on the boat, so you either have to take there's a there's you know I think you took a boat, right? Like but, not the not the ferry that your car was on, but like another boat, right? I took yeah. I I kind of like tried to hike. Oh yeah, and yeah, like yeah. took little launches, like little yeah. speedboats between yeah. islands. That's not really advisable if you have yeah. to be somewhere in a hurry. Yeah, so th I was like kind of anxious about like, oh, you know, am I gonna get stuck and then end up getting hit with all these like storage fees? And I just ended yeah. up flying. It was like three hundred bucks, uh, and I flew to uh, Colombia, and it all worked out. And yeah, but, flying's the the quickest way to do it, yeah. right? And it's would you say it's the cheapest? It's definitely one of the cheapest. Um, well, like, unless you're doing the way you did, which I think was probably cheaper, um, they have like luxury sailing ships, but those are, I think around a thousand from what really? I've heard. I don't know. They're, pr they're yeah, not cheap. I remember <laughs> seeing some for, um, about $500, okay. um, which includes about five days at sea. Um, and it's rough seas. Yeah. People when, usually yeah. get sick and then you get to spend a couple of days on the Sandblast Islands, mm -hmm. which are absolutely stunning. And I think that's the way that most people go. They, yeah. they kind of take the opportunity to have like an all-inclusive um, break from the van or their yeah. vehicle. Yeah, I think I was just like, at that time, really fe feeling the squeeze. Like, you know, in California, I did my engine rebuild. And then I like, you know, four months later, I guess I did Central in about four or five months. I, you know, had to do the shipping, which was another 1500 plus the 300 for the flight or like would have been more for the boat. I was like, it was already feeling like a financial squeeze. So I just went for like the cheapest, most convenient route. Yeah. But I think that's the, the option that most families choose mm -hmm. as well, actually, because you pay per person on the boat. So I found that most families um, would fly between the two mm -hmm. countries. Um, yeah, I wouldn't really recommend that people try to do it the way I did. 
you know, but there does seem to be, there is a wiki page, uh, I'll try to link it below here, that tells you how to get across the Darien in the way that I went. And I believe that people are starting to set up accommodation along the way, so you won't have to string your hammock up in a football stadium like I did. <laughs> stadium, <laughs> like the little village football yeah. concrete thing. Just battle the, the Darien mosquitoes for <laughs> five days straight while you wait to yeah. hitchhike on a boat. And hope you don't get dengue. Because <laughs> there's a lot of that there, right? Yeah. And malaria too. Yeah, malaria, dengue. Um, but don't let that stop you either. Like, no. I, I think a lot of people reach out for the, oh, but there's there's going to be malaria. It's like, oh, there's going to be this. And like, I don't think I even took malaria pills or anything. Like, no, use I repellent if you're, if you're really worried. I think that's the most effective. And yeah, mosquito nets, repellent, or whatever, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, you were just talking about work. You are a website designer. Was that the right way to say yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, web designer or whatever you want to. Okay, um, digital so nomad. Yeah, basically build websites for people and and. Uh, Is that a feasible way to um, finance your lifestyle? Yeah, I would I would say so if you can you can find a good work play balance and and you, you know you have the self control the to be sitting in front of a beautiful beach but you know mm -hmm. hunker down and, and get your work done um the one kind of string attached is that it means you're gonna need to constantly find wi-fi and able to do and how did you do that uh i mean it's it's really the the whole pan am is is pretty connected i'd say just about well like all the major towns and, and cities and even like smaller towns and cities now are getting you know you'll find connection uh can always po pick up a local sim card and and you know if you really need to rely on that um you know the buses in uruguay when i was there in 2011 had wi-fi on the buses i was like having a skype call with somebody <laughs> in canada on a bus like driving down this remote beach road in yeah, uruguay yeah. Mm. that's crazy what the heck that's crazy <laughs> like you don't even have that back home yeah what the hell I think they do now. You haven't been, uh, yeah, I haven't been there for a while. They've probably come out of the dark ages. <laughs> I would say like uh, Bolivia I had was like one of the countries I, I had trouble a lot of trouble finding a decent connection, and it yeah. made it kind of hard to to like to have a balance, and like I had to kind of put some projects on hold and or like hold off on accepting new projects so I could still kind of enjoy the travel aspect of it. But did you find? Did you meet people that were kind of financing their Pan Am trip via working like as they went. Yeah, yeah, I met a few few people doing it out like out of their Volkswagens like selling coffee or t shirts and different stuff like that. Uh, met other people, you know, doing web web development or, you know, online stuff. If um, you are gonna sell stuff um, as you go, hitting up places like um, Belize or southern Mexico for the kind of artisanal yeah. stuff that they have there and then um, or in Guatemala buying it cheap and then selling it in the more expensive countries like I don't know say Colombia or mm -hmm. you can make a bit of money like that you can totally. certainly pay for a few days on the road but that's hard right yeah I mean from experience I, I can't really say but uh I mean I think like one in my, my frame of mind, it's like one website could, you know, fund a couple of weeks of travel, three weeks, four weeks of travel. Whereas like how many cups of coffee you're going to have to sell to to cover the same amount. I, I don't know. It's, yeah. And it's, these cups of coffee are not the same price yeah. as they would be in Canada. They, you know, they it's mm -hmm. South American. Yeah, or it's not Central Starbucks. American. Five dollar coffee prices. Like, no. You can't get away with that <laughs> nonsense <laughs> down there. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to... To, I don't know, but there's people doing it. Some I did try to find a job in the south of Mexico when I was running out of money, and the best I could find was eight dollars a day. Now, whilst that would have been enough to pay for me to live whilst I was there, mm -hmm. it's not really enough to save up to travel. So, um, in my experience, you can find work as you go, but it's it's probably only going to be to maybe like you work in a hostel or something yeah. for free accommodation so that you can extend your trip in that way yeah. and keep your costs down you're not gonna f you'll be un you'll be lucky to find something working locally mm -hmm. to fund a trip like that yeah because even if you know you find something like a bartending gig which in u.s or canada you'd, you'd make a ton on tips it's like the tip culture is not really the same in, in latin america so 
you're not yeah it's going to be hard to get ahead i feel with a lot of those kind of uh t temporary jobs at hostels and, yeah. and stuff like that there is one site i've heard of called HelpX. i don't know if it's dot net or dot com or org but it's uh basically list jobs all over the world um either on farms or hostels or all kinds of stuff house sitting tons of different jobs and like that that's a good resource i think i know a few friends who use that and have, or have just been traveling like from place to place and each place they go they find something like that so at least like their meals and accommodation are covered and mm -hmm. sometimes those will actually pay you on top of the meals and accommodation mm -hmm. too which is another option yeah. i don't know i think there's there's always like a way a way if you if you yeah. have the will right yeah uh, there's always and, and going know. back to like the um if you do uh, come come to the point where you need to go back mm -hmm. home and work and then come back like yeah. is, is it expensive i don't think i asked for you to 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 leave your bus somewhere um, secure did you spend a lot of money doing that, so like, like, that going yeah like bucks. columbia 75. for three weeks was like 75 Peru, I lucked, I, I lucked out and just left it with a, a friend of a friend in, in their garage. And same in Brazil, I left it. My my friend from Toronto, his cousin lived in outside of Rio, so he had like a big property and just left it there. And it was like for free for six months. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this, I mean, this area is about a dollar a day. Yeah, um, in the south of Baja California. Um, that is actually a good point because a lot of people uh, think about doing this trip and they think there's no way that I could ever take six months off from my business or my lifestyle and go and do this. Mm -hmm. But there are people that do it in chunks, yeah. mm -hmm. that they drive a car down. Say they work contractually, they're like two months on, two months off mm -hmm. or whatever, however it is. Um, they'll drive down a bit, park the car, fly back, fly back to the car and keep going all the way. It might take them five years to, like me, <laughs> <laughs> it might take them a long time to to do the Pan American Highway, yeah. but you don't have to do it all in one go. Yeah. Yeah. You know that is totally, totally an option. Yeah, yeah, we know heaps of people. We've met a lot of people doing that that um, stop and yeah. go back home, work, and come back to the car. Yeah. And yeah, and if you can make local friends, I mean, you might not yeah. even have to pay storage fees. And yeah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's an Good option. Life. So no excuses. No excuses. Well, you, I mean, that's the thing. You can make any excuse you want, but at the end of the day, I think it's an excuse, really. Like, it just comes down to to deciding, I'm going to do this, and, like, I'll, f you know, there's going to be challenges and just finding the way, right? Like, you've yeah. come across quite a few challenges. and <laughs> That's the stuff that you makes know. you stronger, though. Yeah, exactly. Those are the, the it, it's the... It's not an adventure until something goes wrong, right, they say. Exactly. And it's those those challenges that you overcome that help you grow as a person. They're the things that you're most likely to remember and they usually turn into the best stories. So, mm -hmm. like. And this is that horror we just recently um, heard about that the people that got crashed. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of a showstopper. Yeah, if your you I mean, bus becomes a write-off. Yeah. That can happen situation. any, you know, that can happen in your own hometown. You can get... Yeah, yeah, T-boned or something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. bad That's stuff true. can happen anywhere, and and I think uh, a lot of people have this uh, a negative idea of Latin America in general, just because of how it's portrayed a lot in Hollywood and and the media. But uh, I don't know your experience, but I just know almost everyone I came across was really friendly and opening and mm -hmm. kind. And I mean, there's bad apples everywhere, and yeah. and hopefully you don't come across them. But like, uh, it can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I'm sure you guys have similar experiences. Yeah, but like we 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 well we did another podcast about safety and security in, in Latin America, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, we haven't really heard of many horror stories, or we haven't experienced mm -hmm. any horror stories either. Anyway, yeah. I mean, use your common sense. Yeah, don't drive at night. That's, nope. a, that's good advice. <laughs> Partly because of bandits, but mostly because yeah. the roads are really bad. Yeah, there'll be cows in the middle of the road or just washed out road or potholes yeah. that are like... And you miss the scenery when you drive at night anyway, so yeah. what's the point? Exactly. And the best, the best time to find a, a free place to, to sleep is before it gets dark. So Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what else have we got? Other things we can speak about? Um, where to get water. Water. This is a funny one, but people <laughs> do sometimes like wonder. The food mm -hmm. seems to be fairly obvious, like there must be people eating down there. Yeah. And then there's the water thing. People start rumors like, don't drink the ice. You know, <laughs> locals don't want to drink bad water either. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, all of the ice is purified. Yeah. And they the, the drinking water that they would give you in a tap is good quality drinking water. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. 
I would say for the most part. Um, tap water. <laughs> tap water, I might be depending where you are. Like, I always ask people, local people, what, you know, their take on it is. Did you drink much tap water? Um, like, it varied place to place. Like, you know, if, a lot of the time I find beach towns, you want to be careful because um, I think just in general they have more issues with getting fresh water but if you're up in the mountains like I'd be more prone to to drinking the mm -hmm. tap water or major city like chances are they have water you know sanitation and stuff to a higher level so just talk to, to local people and you know feel it out and even a lot of countries too they have like uh, clean water stations where you can yeah. like yeah go pay a couple bucks and they'll fill your jugs and that's what yeah, we tended to do most yeah. of the time just to avoid any doubt um mm -hmm. it's super cheap it's mm -hmm. what a lot of the locals do there's just you know they have reverse osmosis mm -hmm. and they they fill it up in a few seconds they clean the bottles for you yeah. um you know why not yeah and i mean like every store every gas station and store is going to sell water bottles but like that in mind you don't want to like mess up the environment by constantly yeah. tossing out you know bottle after bottle and, yeah for sure yeah. But if but, you're in a pinch, you can all, you know, you're not going to I don't think starve or, you uh, had those purification tablets. I'm not sure if that would be a good thing to do long term. No, no, I wouldn't yeah, recommend it. I think that's if you're in a jam. Yeah. Emergency. But the pen, you can get those pens. Um, there was a guy that traveled, jumped in the bus. And the UV pens. Yeah, he was one of the first people to jump in the bus back in Argentina. And um, you just stick a, the light in and it kills mm. like 99.9% .9 of viruses and bacteria mm -hmm. don't quote me on that but i mean it's a good thing to have you know so that's mm -hmm. an option mm -hmm. yeah but water but shouldn't be a showstopper either there was never a, a situation where you'd no. get stuck without water it, it eventually rains yeah. somewhere yeah <laughs> eventually. what about um speaking of drinking about water medical situations you did had you to, have to go have any yeah. dramas? i had a i had an allergic reaction in ecuador and went to the hospital and they like you know, gave me something i should that was like one thing my my mom was actually kind of like upset about she's like how did you go to the hospital and they gave you something you don't know what you took and i was like i don't know it made me feel better <laughs> and like, but uh you had a white coat i on. mean she works in a hospital back home so yeah. she has like a different perspective i guess on it and like it would probably be good to to you know write down what you're you've been given or taken and um I needed stitches once or twice too, and that was. Uh, I mean, the medical systems are pretty pretty good, and I don't think I even used my like travel insurance. It was so. I think it was like in Colombia and in, uh, Brazil, it was like free. Mm. I don't I don't know how that was, but. I, I had trouble. Um, I didn't really have to go to the doctor all that often. Um, I found when I did, or when people I was with did, that the, it was always really cheap, mm. um, and nobody ever had insurance, yeah. so. That was good. Um, I had trouble sometimes explaining, like I've got a stomach sickness yeah. and trying to get the right pills for whatever I had. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the, the kind of technicalities of the, that, that language. I can speak basic Spanish, but when it comes to, mm -hmm. you know, saying, I've got worms or yeah. something like that. Like, <laughs> hang on, let me get my dictionary. Yeah. Worm. Well, this is like yeah. another reason that having a local sim is handy because then you can just pop open Google uh, Translate and mm. off it goes. Mm -hmm. Instant communication. But another point on that is don't rely on Google Translate too much or you're not going to learn anything because that was like a mistake I made at the start. I just like always default to Google <laughs> Translate and then I realized like I'm not learning anything this way. Like I need to, you know, struggle out and be like, como dice <laughs> you know, this and that and like, act it out and, and that's how you're really gonna pick it up I think yeah um, we're talking a lot about like Latin America and like south of the US border but did you have any issues once you got into the US and Canada going all the way up um, that people need to be aware of like, obviously it's more expensive like yeah, eating and they also the US just elected this guy uh, kind of a douchebag <laughs> <laughs> Trump <laughs> wait maybe we should delete that I'm gonna be banned from the US <laughs> Yeah, like the uh, comments on this video just went from 20 <laughs> yeah. to 500. Um, no, it's 
pretty smooth sailing. I mean, that's one thing driving around in a painted hippie van that people ask me a lot are like, oh, don't you get pulled over by the police all the time? And like, surprisingly in North America, I've not been pulled over once, like, mm. um, which is, which is cool, knock on wood. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know, like. It's hard to find places to sleep. Again, default kind of like Walmart. There's yeah. a Walmart in every city. Um, to find nice places like at the beach that you would find. That's going to be trickier. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a lot of lot more. Uh, oh, what do you call it? Uh, regulation in the U.S. and mm -hmm. Canada as far as you know camping and stuff and. Uh, so you, you know you might get a knock on the. I've never had it, but I've heard, you know met numerous You've other never people. Never had the knock. No. What? Never. Nobody oh home. Nobody home. <laughs> <laughs> that is strange because this vehicle is like not very stealthy. Yeah. It's bright and colourful and like. I know, and so, I, I've know done lots of urban there. camping and like never had the knock. That so. is crazy. Maybe it is good vibes. Very yeah. Nice. People are like, oh, he must be all right. I want to travel with you. <laughs> got, like, definitely got good karma. <laughs> Yeah. All right. What else do you think people need to know about the Pan American? I would like to know because a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to like Latin America. I'm going to drive to South America. Um, I need to take the biggest, baddest four by four vehicle that uh, I can possibly take. You did it in a two wheel drive vehicle. I did yeah. it in a two wheel drive vehicle. What do you think? Like, was there a lot of times that you felt that you missed out? Not at all. And like, as a matter of fact, I went in quite quite rocky and off you know off roading and quite like crazy terrains and like this thing ha just handles so well it's it was a really good design I mean it doesn't have a ton of power but I guess just the way the weight's distributed and like it has a lot of ground clearance so you know you might have to go a little bit slower but like you'll you'll make it through and I've never you know besides going out onto a beach and like getting stuck in the sand I've never really gotten stuck anywhere and, and gone mm. on some really fun off-road adventures so I don't think you need four wheels. Like, I've even had times where locals are like, oh, you can't go there without four wheels. No way. No, yeah. no, no way. You can't go. And I, I went, and I'm like, yeah, this was fine. <laughs> yeah, I did too. Um, yeah, I would say get a vehicle with good good clearance because, you know, there are lots of places where the, the roads are very uneven and, and you don't want to be bottoming out and potentially doing damage to your vehicle. But I don't think you need four-wheel drive. Yeah, so. always asking the locals what's the road like yeah. ahead of uh, ahead of me is is good. Yeah. Um, it's a good option. Apart from the time I asked if I could make it back up that hill if I go down it, and they said, "Yeah, you'd be fine." <laughs> I was stuck down there for five days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never gonna leave. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got stuck on one. There's like one hill in in Peru, and I was like, I went down it and then the it was blocked at the bottom and I couldn't turn around and like trying to get out in reverse it was so steep that like I didn't have a good run at it at all uh, that's the good that option a though good to option. go out in reverse because yeah. you, you have more power in reverse mm -hmm. right or more torque or whatever it is it's easier yeah so two wheel drives um, get the thumbs okay. up yeah as long <laughs> as it's a Volkswagen <laughs> <laughs> yeah I can't vouch for other other brands and makes but <laughs> absolutely um, can you think of anything else that we haven't touched on that other people might hmm. wonder about the Pan American? It's been pretty thorough, this conversation. Yeah, we've talked about a lot. Mm. Um, you meet a lot of people doing it, like coming over from Europe and doing mm -hmm. it and coming down. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Euros Europe. doing it. In fact, I think that there was more Europeans doing the Pan American Highway than there were Americans or Latin Americans. Um, mm -hmm or at least 50-50, mm -hmm. um, which is quite surprising. So we would like to see more people from the States. Thank you very much yeah. for getting down there. Um, it's a heck of an adventure. It's If you are American, it's on your doorstep. You know, you are already attached to the longest road in the world. What are you waiting for? Like, pretty much, I think much, it's right? the time. I think it's, it, people don't take that much time off to do things like that. But like we said, we, you can do it in parts and like stop and mm -hmm. start. And, it's possible to do it. It is possible to do it. It's the best investment of the time of your own time that you could ever have. I mean, do something for yourself. You'd spend the rest of your time in your life doing stuff yeah. for other people. I concur. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. You will not regret it. Mm. Yeah. Even if you do it and you absolutely hate it and you think this is the worst thing I've ever done with my time, at least at the end of your life, you're not going to be like, I wish what I if, that. what if I well, had just done that one big adventure? Mm. I would love to hear from someone. If there's someone listening and you 
did the Pan Am and you hated it. I would personally love to hear about your experience because yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm highly doubtful that there's anyone who has done the Pan American or or a good portion of it and not loved yeah. it and mm. enjoyed it and thought it was valuable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to think, like, a lot of people that we meet that are that are about to do it, like, we met a lot of people in Alaska mm. and um, uh, Canada that were just starting, and they were just concerned mainly about safety. Mm. Yeah, that's, like, probably the biggest, the biggest thing that question, always comes yeah. up. Is it safe? Yeah, is it safe to sleep, like, on the road? Like, yeah. Yeah, like you said before, you just need to, you know... You'll yeah, find yeah. your feet, I mean... You you just you'll figure it out when you get going. You'll know what's where you can sleep remotely. Mm -hmm. For the most part, if you are more remote, you are potentially more of a risk because people feel like they might be able to come and you know ask you for your possessions or take your possessions mm -hmm. without other people seeing, seeing your like mm -hmm. getting without other people seeing that they're committing a crime. Um, on the other hand the most remote places are the most rewarding places because mm -hmm. you know you get the best views. You like that's that's the stuff you post on your Instagram and like yeah. that's the stuff that makes everybody want to go and do it in the first place so um, you just got to play it by ear you, yeah. you figure it out you arrive in a town you ask people if it's dangerous mm -hmm. um, and then you you know mm -hmm. you stay or you don't mm -hmm. I'm amazed like in in the US close to the border how much like miss I don't know how distorted people's perceptions are of Mexico because like you'd meet people in, in Texas or or Cal you know even southern california that like are like you're going to go into mexico like you're going to lose you're going to get decapitated are you crazy yeah. it's a war zone and you're like yeah like Me mexico has its problems mm -hmm. definitely you know there's some serious issues here but for the mo i mean that's not spilling over so much into like tourism and and, mm -hmm. and that right and for the most part it's fairly safe as long as you're again traveling in the daytime and you know, do some research about the different areas and, and, you know, if you're sticking to the, the coast, like the Pacific, you're, you're not going to come across issues. Mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. there are problems with the cartel, but don't you think that that problem with one country saying the next country is dangerous is typical th throughout the world. Yeah. Like every time yeah. I got to a border, that country, the people there would say, Oh, you don't want to go yeah. there. Or you got to be yeah. really careful when you go to Nicaragua. Yeah. And when you get there, and they're Nicaragua, like, Oh, they're like, Oh, Panama, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> In, Colombia, people oh, Ecuador, just, do not go to... And Venezuela, forget about it. It's just criminals. People <laughs> are just scared of um, what they don't know, yeah. and they like to hang on to that fear. To, like they, That validates them for mm. not having to go to the other place. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, go find out for yourself, and then make up your own mind. Yeah. I'm tell, I've done it. I'm telling you, it's fine. Yeah. So. It's fine. Just keep safe. These you know, things you need to be yeah. aware of. And Street smarts. Yeah. Carry a machete. Don't take the shortcut through the dark alley at night. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm sure there was a PSA like that or something. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Aaron. Yeah, it was a pleasure. It's thanks really for, cool uh, chatting me on your show. <laughs> picking your brain. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing all your wisdom with the world. Yeah. Well, hopefully we've inspired some people with these tips. That's that's what's all the name of the game. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck with your next adventure. Yeah, and likewise. Like, See you in Europe? Perhaps. Hey. <laughs> see where the road takes us. Yeah, we'll see. Awesome, thank you. Cheers. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Uh, I hope you found it useful and interesting. If anyone has any questions, please leave them in the comments area below. If you are knowledgeable on this subject, long-term travel, or have traveled across the Pan American Highway, or anywhere for that matter, please dive down into the comments too to see if you can help anybody out, because that is what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you have any other um, suggestions on what these advent what you want us to do for these adventure experts, you can leave that below too and we'll try and find an adventure expert so we can sit down and chat with them and get information. Yeah, you can see a couple of our other adventure experts mm -hmm. um, videos that we've made linked somewhere around the screen and around our faces. So uh, go check that out if you've still got time to be sitting down with us for another long chat. If not, save it for next time because mm -hmm. they are very useful. Mm -hmm. Until next time. Happy travels. Thank <laughs> you.